When an argument can't be resolved, someone has to have the final word. When you're a kid, that person might be your mom or your dad. But in the United States system of government, it's the Supreme Court. In 1954, the Supreme Court took steps to end racial segregation in public schools in a case called Brown v. Board of Education. And a lot of people were not happy about it. In fact, two presidents had to do something they really did not want to do. Send in the troops. Hey guys, welcome back to A Kid Explains History after a uh, brief hiatus. In honor of Black History Month, today we're going to talk about the landmark Brown v. Board case, which has its roots all the way back to the period right after the American Civil War. It was called Reconstruction, because, you guessed it, the nation needed to be reconstructed. Republican leaders in Congress, like Schuyler Colfax and Thaddeus Stevens, had plans to help former slaves by giving them the right to citizenship and the right to vote. What's important to our story is one line in the 14th Amendment, called the Equal Protection Clause. It basically says that you're not allowed to discriminate based on race. However, this didn't stop many former Confederate states from doing just that. They passed Black Codes and early Jim Crow laws as soon as federal troops left the South in 1876. So, inevitably, this landed on the Supreme Court's desk, in the case Plessy v. Ferguson. Homer Plessy was a mixed-race man who tested segregation laws by sitting in a white-only zone on a rail car in New Orleans. If that sounds familiar, Rosa Parks did something similar in 1955. After being arrested, Plessy sued the state of Louisiana, saying that segregation laws violated the Equal Protection Clause. And obviously, the Supreme Court agreed, right? Wrong. In a 6-1 decision with the only dissent coming from John Marshall Harlan, the court sided with Louisiana, making Jim Crow settled law. Everything in the South and many states in the West were segregated, from water fountains to restaurants, and also public schools. White schools were well-funded and great places to learn, while African-American schools were dirt poor and had a low quality of education. Since the 1930s, black scholars and activists had been following a legal strategy to challenge these laws. They found people from all over the country to file these suits. One of these people was a man named Oliver Brown in Topeka, Kansas. His seven-year-old daughter Linda was forced to attend an all-black school on the other end of town, even though there was an all-white school just four blocks away from their house. With the help of the NAACP, Brown sued the Topeka Board of Education. The Kansas Court of Appeals sided with the school board, so the NAACP decided to take this case all the way to the Supreme Court. Now, the Supreme Court was already considering around five other cases, all concerned with the same thing, segregation in public schools. So they combined them all into one, with the Brown family as the face of it. The NAACP hired future Supreme Court justice and current lawyer Thurgood Marshall to argue their case. This made national headlines. Everyone all over the country wanted to hear what the court's decision was. But it kept being delayed. Why? Well, Chief Justice Fred Vinson was worried that the Supreme Court's decision wouldn't be unanimous, causing more division among the public. So he postponed it for a whole year, and then he died. President Dwight D. Eisenhower appointed the former governor of California, Earl Warren, to replace Fred Vinson. Warren also agreed that the court's decision had to be unanimous, and he had heated discussions with his colleagues, trying to get them to vote in favor of Brown. On May 17, 1954, the court did just that. In a 9-0 decision, public segregation in schools was no longer allowed. The court reaffirmed this decision the following year in Brown v. Board 2, saying that desegregation should happen with all haste. The South didn't like this. At all. While some schools did start to desegregate, others violently opposed it. In 1957, in Little Rock, Arkansas, nine black students were set to enroll in Little Rock Central High School. The governor of Arkansas, Orville Faubus, ordered the Arkansas National Guard to surround the school and refuse entry to the Little Rock Nine. That's right. He called the soldiers on the children. When word reached President Eisenhower, he thought this was absurd, as states weren't allowed to ignore court rulings. So he did something unprecedented. Invoking the 1807 Insurrection Act, the president sent federal troops of the 101st Airborne Division to escort the children to school. Troops are there pursuant to law. Such an extreme situation has been created in Little Rock. This challenge must be met. He also nationalized the Arkansas National Guard, basically taking control away from the governor and into the hands of the president. This was absolutely huge. Eisenhower had just made it clear that the federal government would enforce integration if the states would not. You'd think that'd be the end of it, but no. In 1961, Eisenhower was replaced by Jack Kennedy. And two years later, the governor of Alabama, George Wallace, who was famous for this gem of a quote. And I say segregation now, 
segregation tomorrow and segregation forever. <laughs> stood in the doorway of the University of Alabama, refusing to let two black students pass him. President Kennedy nationalized the Alabama National Guard, and General Henry Graham walked right up to Governor Wallace and said, Sir, it is my sad duty to ask you to step aside on orders of the President of the United States. There was a fear that they would have to arrest the governor. But after all this fuss, Wallace did the right thing. He stood aside. After the Alabama incident, the stand in the doorway trick wasn't tried again. In 1964, President Lyndon Johnson signed the Civil Rights Act and Voting Rights Act, making segregation and voter suppression explicitly illegal. And everyone understood that he would enforce it. But that deserves its own video. You might think the story ends here, but it's important to remember that racial injustice is still alive and well in the United States. And while the legal battle may have been won with Brown v. Board and the Civil Rights Act, the systemic fight is still ongoing. Thank you all for watching. Again, this is a very deep and important topic, so we've left some further reading in the description if you want to check that out. And apart from that, make sure to join our community on social media. We're posting a lot more on TikTok and Instagram, and we'd love to hear what you think. See you guys next time.